Criminal justice experts have known for years that our courts can deliver unequal justice for black and white defendants. My guest today has committed much of her scientific career to figuring out why. Dr. Vanessa Edkins is an associate professor of psychology at the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne. Her research takes us into the minds of criminal defendants and their attorneys, as well as juries and prosecutors. In a realistic experiment involving nearly 100 Florida Tech students, Edkins and her team discovered something frightening about innocent defendants and plea bargaining. In one of the most eye-opening interviews I've done in a long time, I asked Edkins to explain her findings, including what she calls the innocent defendant's dilemma. One. One. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I love your work. Uh, but one passage really stood out to me, and I just wanted to share that with our viewers. Um, when you're talking about plea bargaining, and you said that roughly 90 to 95 percent of convictions in criminal cases are obtained through a guilty plea, with the majority of those pleas presumably worked out through plea bargains. The benefits are obvious in cases in which conviction is a highly probable outcome, but the process is making one very important assumption that the defendant is guilty as charged. Now you've done some research that calls into question just how often are they guilty. Tell me a little bit about your experiment that you've just uh, published some results from. Yeah, well, I, I, the whole field of plea bargaining is really ripe for research right now. Um, we're really starting to realize that our focus on juries and jury decision making is very much restricted. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do is look at plea bargaining, but it's very difficult to access plea bargaining experimentally, right? We can't manipulate actual guilt or innocence of a crime. Uh, we can't manipulate whether or not somebody's offered a plea or not. I mean, it's not ethical. So we have to find a way to try and create the same psychological constructs, of, of, I admit, to a much, much less degree, okay. um, within a laboratory setting while still trying to get the you know, validity of plea bargaining. So we actually borrowed a paradigm that um, was created by Melissa Rossano and some of her colleagues to look at false confessions. She was looking at, which is highly related to plea bargains of innocent defendants, um, she was looking at false confession and interrogation tactics. And what they did was actually manipulate whether or not somebody was guilty or innocent of the crime of cheating. So this is, this is what we took as a springboard and worked off of. And what we actually did, uh, we brought individuals into the lab and we used what's called a confederate in research. And that's somebody who seems as though they're a participant. They're a plant. But they're, they're a plant, okay. exactly. They're actually in on the research. So it was one of our research assistants, another undergraduate student. Um, and we had a variety of them playing the part. Um, and they would pretend as though they were a participant, and we would have one actual participant in there. And they're being proctored in a room on some kind of a test? Or? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we'd bring them in, and we'd tell them that this is a study on um, how people work together to solve decisions and, and to make um, decisions solve logic problems, and how well they work separately. And we explained to them uh, that the credibility of the study required that when we told them they had to work separately, they worked separately, and when they worked together, that they actually worked together. So we used um, mock um, LSAT questions okay. uh, and modified them a little bit. And for the first part of the experiment, we said, okay, here are your questions. We want you to solve these together. So we had them working together, and then the experimenter would leave. Um, and they'd solve the questions. Experimenter would come back and say, okay, now for the second part, we want you to work separately. And remember, for the integrity of the study, you need to work separately. You can't help each other. And uh, the experimenter would then again leave. And the experimenter was what we call blind to the condition. So when the experimenter left the room, they don't know what happened next. But one of two things occurred. Uh, our confederate, our plant, <laughs> would either do nothing and actually work through the problems on their own. Um, or in half of the cases, and they'd flip a coin beforehand to decide okay. what was going to happen, uh, half of the cases the confederate would start asking for help. And uh, it was quite easy to get <laughs> individuals. We actually only had 
two cases where we had to um, exclude participants from our data set because they wouldn't cheat. Uh, sometime it took. So we're talking a about a hundred Florida Tech yeah, it was, students. There was roughly yeah, close to a hundred between 80 and 100. 98 percent. Well, uh, no, yeah, but half of those were in the cheating condition. Okay. Um, and our Confederates were very nice and friendly, and it would be something like, so for question number three, what did you get? And then if the person, usually the first response was, well, we're supposed to work alone. But they wouldn't accept that, of course. Okay. And then they'd be, yeah, all right. And then, you know, I got C. I think it's C because blah, 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 and there was a scripted reason they would give. And then usually the people would help and say whether or not they chose C or D, et cetera. So in half these cases, we've got somebody who is reluctantly or not participating in what seems to be academic dishonesty or cheating right. of some yeah. kind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, we made it so for those LSAT problems, the last two, there were actually no correct answers. Um, so people couldn't say, you know, so they were less suspicious. Okay. So after that was done, uh, the experimenter would leave, and of course, again, the experimenter didn't know whether or not cheating occurred. In every single circumstance, they would come back in and say, we've got a problem. I'm going to need to talk to you guys individually. And they'd say, they'd look down at their clipboard and they'd pick one of the two names, but it was always the Confederate. Say, can you come with me? And get the Confederate out of the room. Okay. They'd wait five minutes, and uh, they'd go back in and say, all right, we have an issue. You and your partner had the same wrong answers on the last two questions. And the chances of that happening randomly are less than 4%. So when this occurs, we have to treat it as though it's academic dishonesty. And we're going to have to inform the major professor in charge of the research that academic dishonesty has occurred. So yeah, some of them get that That's look. That's big on trouble these days. <laughs> yes. Um, and we, when we passed this through our institutional review board, we had a whole host, a booklet of possible responses that, at that point in time, we would say, "No, okay, study over, debrief. You're not actually in trouble. You're okay." You know. So if the lips started quivering or something mm -hmm. of that sort, or uh, if they appeared way too anxious, we'd halt. Okay. And uh, and you know, it's okay. This was just a study. You're not actually in trouble. No one's throwing themselves off the Crawford building. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, um, and people responded quite well. Uh, we didn't have to stop too many times. And we had, I mean, everything you can think of that looked like, you know. So you're taking these to... students who, you know, some have, some have been, they're innocent and some of them are yes. te guilty in this setting. Yeah. And adjudicating them through the academic dishonesty system at the university. Well, and it never gets that far. We basically threaten them with that because okay. that would be the equivalent of like a trial, right? Right. So here we're going to... Yeah. So okay. here is where we look at the actual plea bargaining. So the person says, you know, if you sign this piece of paper admitting to doing it, say that you're guilty, say that you did commit this form of academic dishonesty, uh, we'll you won't be able to get any sort of compensation you promised for the study today, but it ends here, right? So that's kind of, the idea there is that's similar to probation. Sure. okay. You know, sign this piece of paper, say you did it, you know, you're actually accepting guilt and acknowledging guilt, but then you can leave. The other option, if you won't sign the piece of paper, we can take this to trial. Of course, they would call it the take academic it to the review dean, board. Take right? Okay. Yeah. And we structured it as the, the, they were told there was an academic review board that consisted of 10 to 12 faculty and student members. So it was kind of like a jury, okay. right? And that the individual would be able to argue their case in front of that board, and the board would then decide the fate. And it could be expulsion, well, suspension. No, no. Could we be, weren't allowed to do that. You couldn't tell what the fate was going to be. No, we, okay. we can say what the fate is, but. Yeah, the institutional review board. But it was going to be a start. serious process. Yeah. And scary. So we would we would tell them in some cases we'd say you know if if you fail there, you're going to need to go through nine hours of ethics training, and that was supposed to be our somewhat lenient sentence. Okay. Um, or if you fail through there, uh, the other half were told you're going to have to um, en enroll in a three credit class. They wouldn't be charged for it, but attendance was mandatory. 
So, I mean, this was, this was serving their time, okay. really, that okay. three-credit class. Um, and we also wanted to know whether or not the lenient versus the harsh sentence would have an effect on, on our plea rates. So what did the kids do? What did you find? Well, we found an uh, overwhelming majority of those who were actually guilty, um, upwards of almost 90%, 85 to 90% of those students uh, would sign and say, yes, okay, I did it. I forgo all my compensation. I'm not going to take this to an academic review board. It's not going to go any further, which is what you would hope. I mean, right. it was a pretty good deal if you were actually guilty. Although, in most of those cases, the students, even as they were signing, were saying, but I, I, I didn't actually do it. <laughs> so we're, so we're, we're it's, still getting... It's looking and sounding a lot like, you know, the people showing up for the docket out at the yes, Vera Courthouse. Okay. absolutely. Um, but what we were surprised with is we had over half of those who were innocent sign and say, all right, I accept guilt. I'll sign this piece of paper saying that I, Vanessa Edkins, committed academic dishonesty when I knew I didn't, and I knew there had been no academic dishonesty occurring. Um, roughly 56% of those innocent were saying, Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'll that's that. not a small number. 56%? No. I mean, it's over half. They were more likely than not to be taking that deal. So, which how, it surprised us. It really did. So how could that translate to what we hear and see? I just drew the comparison to the people that are at the Vera Courthouse or Titusville or even. Yeah. You think that's happening in our I think it criminal absolutely justice system? Is. And um, I'm certainly not alone on thinking it's happening. It's, it's uh, become a, a national issue and something that's gaining a lot of attention. The way our justice system is set up right now, 95% of convictions are obtained through plea bargains. And if you think, if you did spend a day at the Vieira Courthouse and going through and listening to the dockets, you know, a lot of those charges are for more minor charges, a lot of misdemeanors or very low degree felonies. And if your option is, say you did it and go home that day, versus no, and I can't afford bail, so I'm going back to jail for the next three, four, five, six months to await a trial, lose my right. job in the meantime, you know, I can't afford an attorney. Get out of my home. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, you know, if that's your option, why wouldn't they? The rational choice in that circumstance would likely be to plead guilty, even if you didn't commit that crime. Is there something about knowing the certainty of the outcome versus the uncertainty of going to trial that, that, that weighs in on the human decision making? Yeah, absolutely. And, and when individuals are uh, plea bargaining for innocent or guilty, which we hope the vast, vast majority are actually guilty. We're, you know, we're not claiming that half are innocent right. or anything like that. Um, but that is, that certainty versus uncertainty is what drives decisions most of the time. You know, there is the chance that you get nothing, right? If you go through, you are acquitted. There is that chance. It, it, it's a very low rate. Acquittals um, are usually for most cases, um, 10 to 15 percent tops in jurisdictions would be acquittals. The vast majority are convictions. Wow. So chances are you're going to be convicted, but there is that chance. It could be nothing. You could be free. You could be back out on the street with no record. Um, or, of course, if you don't want to roll that die, then you've got the option of taking a reduced sentence and just getting it over and done with. Holy smoke. Well, you, you cited a case uh, that I was surprised to learn about, uh, having watched this kind of activity happen in our courts all the time, and that was a case called Brady versus the United States, which uh, said that plea bargaining is a tool for use only when the evidence of guilt is overwhelming and the defendant might benefit from the opportunity to bargain. Right. Wow. And, and the, the Supreme Court basically, in effect, in 1970 with that case said, all right, we accept it, plea bargaining is okay. Uh, up until that point in time, um, the Supreme Court and appellate courts were striking down plea bargains um, and oftentimes as being too coercive. Just the very fact that the sentence, in some cases, the sentence was going to be, the sentence the individual accepted was half of what he would have gotten had he been convicted at trial. And they said, no, that's too coercive. When actually a sentence of half nowadays is 
pretty Yeah, I mean, we, tough, we get it? sentences that are, are very, very low compared to life in prison for a lot of these crimes. Um, but the Supreme Court finally acknowledged, and a lot of pressure came from the American Bar Association, that plea bargaining was occurring, and it was, it was a force that, at that point, just it couldn't be stopped. Um, and there is the acknowledgement that if it works properly, it is good. It is a good thing for the justice system. Um, it's just the times when it's not working properly that we need to worry about. And the potential for coercive pleas. Uh, and actually, in that case, the Supreme Court talked about how uh, it should be reserved for those cases where you're sure of a conviction. Um, and then the sentences can be reduced just a small amount. But the fact of the matter is, if you're sure of a conviction, a lot of times those are not the cases you're going to be pleading. Those are easy wins in a trial. And it's the ones where you don't have the strong evidence that you know a jury's going to support that you start offering disparate sentences, you know, five years compared right. to life in prison. So you're actually getting more coercive with less evidence. Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about another, um, really just the findings from uh, some research that you did. I guess it was about 30 years ago that there was a major study of about a thousand different cases into yep. it that looked at the role of race. Yes. Uh, and it's, you know, in sentencing. I guess mm -hmm. back then, 30 years ago, they were looking at how often prosecutors upgrade the charges against black clients versus, black defendants versus white, mm -hmm. found that black got upgraded more often. Yeah. Sometimes even with death penalty uh, situations. Yeah. You took it a step farther though, updated that with a fresh batch of a thousand cases and also added in data and looked at the plea bargains. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the findings sounded like uh, that, that, that was a little bit surprising. It was that black defendants got a little bit better plea, plea, bargain. plea bargains yeah. but a tougher penalty if they went to trial. Yeah, if they exercised their constitutional rights and chose trial, they were actually getting a harsher, we call it a trial penalty. Um, and there are different ways to refer to it, but trial penalty meaning the sentence is increased beyond what the plea would have given you. And we're finding that they're, those individuals, the black defendants who are taking their cases to trial, uh, and we're also finding that they are overrepresented in those going to trial. And we don't know if they're not being offered the same pleas because we don't have, plea bargaining doesn't occur, you know, out in the open. Right. Um, plea bargaining is more of a backroom. We don't know thing. what happened in these cases. We just no. know And what... there's no record of it. Okay. I mean, you don't have to. If you're talking about a plea bargain or not talking about a plea bargain, that generally doesn't go on the record. Um, in some jurisdictions, they have official plea conferences and that will go on the register of actions, but a lot of these are informal. Hmm. So we don't know if, if they're not being offered pleas as often or if they're rejecting them more often, but we are finding that they are getting a harsher trial penalty, um, but their initial pleas, if they accept them, they're actually getting slightly less sentence or a slightly uh, lower sentence than those white defendants. And they were also being convicted more frequently, it sounded like. It sounded uh, from your research that uh, black defendants wound up being convicted 81% well, of the time versus, or 85 versus 71 or something for white defendants? Well, no, um, that's a different study. That was actually the study looking at defense attorneys and their perception. Oh, okay, we'll get to that in a minute yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what, okay, so we don't know why this is happening uh, in, right. in in the um, in the Florida courts, but we think that it, the old study was maybe it was jury biased right. somehow. Yeah, especially if they go to to court that there is some kind of jury bias against black defendants versus white, and then they yeah. wind up getting penalized. But it brings us to the next study that you did, and that was maybe there's something more to this, and it's not just juries, and it's yeah. not just prosecutors, and it's not just mean judges, but it's the it's the defendant's yeah. own attorneys making decisions about mm -hmm. what's best for their clients or what they're most likely to get or not get yeah. going in there. Explain. So I, I was really interested when we started to move away from jury research because one of my interests has always been um, discrimination and, and disparity in the justice system and what this does arise from. 
and we had decades of established research showing that part of it can be because of juries, right? Um, that their decisions can have a race component. Um, and, but then that's only 5% of cases. So right. if we look at the, the vast 95. disparity, I mean, we've got uh, the overrepresentation of minorities in the justice system is just incredible. Even in the Florida sample that I'm using right now, um, looking at um, homicide cases, about 57% of the defendants are African American. About 16, 17% of Floridians are African American. So it's it's a huge, huge overrepresentation um, in the justice system. So that all can't be because of juries, right? Right. Uh, so what else is going on? And one of the things I thought would be really interesting, you know, what if it has to do not just with judges or prosecutors or police? But what about the actual advocate, the one person standing up there for that client? Is so there some bias out there? And found yeah. about a hundred Florida defense attorneys, either in private practice or public yeah. defenders' mm -hmm. offices, and gave them. It sounded like from from your research, w was it online or was it just yeah. a series of different sort of variables and situations? What would you do in this? Well, it was just one. So um, the part of this, the important part of this manipulation is, is every attorney just saw one case. Okay. Uh, and they just decided on that one case. But behind the scenes, you were zapping them yeah, different this, information yeah, with the, different variables so that you could measure. Exactly. Okay. So uh, we manipulated the description of the defendant. Either this was, and I think it was Richard Williams or some you know common name like that. And we described him as a 23-year-old Caucasian American male or a 23-year-old African American male. And we went through this little jewelry store robbery uh, example. And uh, so half of the attorneys would read that he was Caucasian American. Half of the attorneys would read that he was African American. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also manipulated the strength of the evidence, too, to see what sort of impact that had. And actually, race had a stronger impact than strength of the evidence, which was surprising. Um, but what we found, uh, what I found was that um, the attorneys were, when they were asked, and of course it's always up to the defendant whether or not they accept the plea. Of course. But they turn to the attorneys, right? And they want to know, you know, what should I do? And um, I found that the attorneys were more willing when the actual client was described as an African American male they were more willing to suggest that a plea be taken that contained some prison time, um, and less so when the individual was Caucasian. So they were more willing to accept a plea with prison time for an African American client. Um, they were uh, more willing to reject a plea altogether with a white client and say, we're going to fight this hmm. in, in court. Is that because the attorneys were racist? No. Absolutely not. And, and that's one point I really want to make. Um, it isn't. I mean, all of these are, are, if there is some sort of bias occurring, it's unconscious, right? They, they don't realize that, but it likely comes from working within a justice system where they see stereotypes played out in front of them. And also, and I found this especially because I looked at both Florida attorneys and national um, sample of attorneys. And with a national sample of attorneys, when I asked them, you know, what do you think the chances are that this person would be convicted if this went to trial, to see if that was what was driving their actual decisions. And the national sample for the white and black defendant were just as likely to say he would be convicted. But for the Florida sample, it was different. Um, in the strong cases especially, for the Florida sample, when I asked that question and the individual had been described as African American, they were coming back with 85%. That's his chance of conviction. When he was Caucasian, they were coming back with 70, 71%. That's what the number that I goofed up yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I think I saw in your some of your findings that the attorneys were actually less likely to believe in the guilt. Yes, absolutely. They of were the less black likely. client, mm -hmm. and yet were more likely to recommend that he accept plea bargains plea. that they accept. Yeah. Because it's was what was the, the the phrase, I'm not racist, but juries are. Yeah. yeah. And they're afraid of that. Yeah. They I and it might be an acknowledgement that there is systemic racism out there and if this is being offered for this client, maybe this is the best out. Which is of course very unfortunate. I mean that's not going 
with what the evidence is speaking, that's going with perceptions of what a jury may or may not do. Um, but looking at the actual cases, there might be something to that. So who is the audience for this research? And we've got about two minutes here left, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, what's next? Um, well, you hope for some improvement that somebody sees this and yeah, acts I mean, better because of findings? Or I'm actually working with a group right now of lawyers, political scientists, criminologists, sociologists, and psychologists, and we're trying to make this research go across more areas so that people in all of these areas are seeing it and, and are becoming familiar with it. Um, and some of the newer research we're doing, we're actually going to be looking at collateral consequences or these things that are tied to convictions. So like um, not being able to vote, not being able to collect food stamps, not being able to live in public housing because you've accepted this plea deal it seemed so fantastic at the time, and now right. you've got this criminal record to contend with. And for that, we actually want to target um, prosecuting attorneys, judges, etc., and see, you know, what they're communicating with regards to collateral consequences to defendants. And ultimately, I mean, we want everybody to be aware of this stuff. But yeah, we're trying to reach the criminal justice system players and and make people aware that there are problems going on and things that need to be considered. Well, let's hope Dr. Atkins' research leads to a more just system for everyone. That's our program for today. As always, we welcome your comments and criticism of anything you see or hear on the show. Just shoot me an email at letters at floridatoday.com. I'm Matt Reed. We'll see you right here next week on WEFS-TV and floridatoday.com.